Hi, I'm Henry Yallop, Keeper of Edge Weapons and Armour, and I'm here with a mortuary sword that's reputed to be Oliver Cromwell's, and this is Up in Arms. The sword I'd like you to show you today is one of the more controversial ones from our collection. It's reputed to be Oliver Cromwell's and supposedly carried by him during the storming and subsequent sacking of Drogheda in Ireland in 1649. This was part of the parliamentarian reconquest of Ireland, which was part of the British Civil Wars or Wars of Three Kingdoms, as they're sometimes known, uh, fought between 1639 and 1653 across the three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland. This particular sword is a controversial object on pretty much every level. Um, what it is, who it's supposedly linked to and whether it could be linked with them, the specific action of Drogheda and the wider context of the parliamentary reconquest of Ireland are all very contentious topics. So starting with uh, the type of sword, uh, the term mortuary sword itself is somewhat questionable and often misunderstood. So what is a mortuary sword? And the short answer is it's swords, any sword with a hilt like this one. This type of complex hilt is very specific to time and place, uh, being specific to the British Isles in the mid 17th century. Uh, they survive in quite large numbers and were favored by cavalry of the period. The characteristic features are a dish or sh uh, boat-shaped stool from which projects um, at the back, towards uh, to the back of the hand, goes towards a wrist guard and a sort of upturned rear quillen. In front of the hand, the uh, stool projects forward into a curved knuckle guard and there's guards both, bar guards both in and outside the hand. So this side being inside, this side being outside. And they're linked to the central knuckle guard between one, with between one and three bars. This one's got one bar, obviously. Oh, these bars, well, all the guards, the knuckle guard and the inner and the outer guard are joined to the pommel, which is usually a sort of rounded form of pommel uh, by form of screws. The grips, are usually ribbed in some way. This one's covered in fish skin, wire is more common, but a lot of the ones you see uh, with wire grips are actually modern replacements. Um, they usually have, as, as this one does, um, twisted wire ferrules at the top and bottom of the grip. The hilts are almost always decorated, and I don't mean in the sense of this one, the japanning on this one, the black and the gold you can see, but uh, very often chiseled. Uh, sometimes pierced like this one and sometimes have other forms of metal applied to the hilts. The hilts themselves are almost always being iron. Usually they have a block at the end of the grip passing through the stool um, onto which project two very small close-fitting langettes with which to hold the scabbard. This one's missing one of them. They are quite fragile so on quite a lot of mortuary swords they are missing or one or more is lost. The blade of this one is broader than most. It's single edge, sometimes turned a back sword at this time. The, most of the section of the blade is a slim wedge shape until the false edge kicks in around here and then it goes to uh, an almost flat lens shaped section. Um, and as you can see, it barely tapers at all into quite a spatulate tip. Uh, it's got a fuller on either face of the blade towards the back or spine, uh, which is quite narrow but quite deep. Um, the back of the blade is flat. But that's not to say um, all mortuary swords have blades like this. You get pretty much any variation. You get double-edged ones, sometimes called broad swords. You get narrow ones, ones with more fullers, uh, ones with sort of flattened diamond section or lens shape with no fullers. Um, so pretty much any type, usually they're straight. Unfortunately, this one doesn't have any maker's marks on the blade, um, but the two types you'll probably find most commonly will be Solingen in Germany, imported blades are very important, and Hounslow maker's marks just outside of London. So why are these swords called mortuary swords? And that goes back to at least 
1881, which is the first recorded instance of mortuary swords being spoken about. Uh, so if you do find a reference earlier than that, please do let me know. Um, and it's because some of these swords have on the hilt faces, heads, um, with, of a male figure with a Van Dyke type beard, which is thought to be or was said to be Charles I, and that these uh, images are a memoriam of his execution in 1649. There's um, several problems with that theory, uh, though. Some of the swords predate his execution in 1649. The rendering of the face is often somewhat generic, so they could pretty much be any male head or gentleman of the period. And you also sometimes get uh, female heads, also somewhat generic, which are said to be Henrietta Maria, his queen. But as I said, the first reference to this is almost 250 years after these swords were in use. Um, so it's generally accepted that these, these faces aren't necessarily uh, Charles and his queen. But today in Arms and Armour we use the term mortuary sword uh, simply to refer to a sword with a hilt like this, whether or not it's got such faces on. As to the Cromwell connection, there's about 10 swords uh, associated with him. But I think this one is the only one that's connected to his use of a particular action um, and a particularly nasty action at that. So this sword was supposedly carried by Cromwell during the siege of Drogheda and when he stormed the walls with these two marks here supposed to be musket ball strikes from when the sword was shot and these various nicks from him using the sword in action um, when they stormed the town and after which um, Cromwell put to death the military garrison and civilians too. Until recently, we could only trace its provenance back to the first catalogue of the Royal United Service Museum, which is where we got it from in the 60s. But um, purely by luck, really, I stumbled across a reference to it um, from a visitor seeing it in 1848, which describes the damage. So we at least, and its provenance, so we at least know that that story goes back to 1848. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that as well, as it is supposedly donated to that museum by a descendant of Cromwell, albeit not a direct one. So that somewhat strengthens the Cromwell claim too. So against this is the applied decoration, or rather the Japaning. Um, more specifically, the fact that the trophies of arms on the hilt contain images of the Union flag. Um, the problem with that being at this point the Union flag was only really in naval use and not becoming in more widespread use until after the Act of Union in 1707. So that being the case, what are Union flags doing on Cromwell's sword of 1649? Also, leaving the Japaning aside, the sword itself is, is pretty plain. You do get very similar hilts to this. In fact, we've got an almost identical one in the museum collection. So it could be that a pretty ordinary mortuary sword has been decorated, japanned, um, sometime after its working life, but before its donation to a museum, um, to support a potentially fictitious Cromwell connection uh, with patriotic, if anachronistic, trophies of arms. Or it could have been used by him at Drogheda. It's not inconceivable that a man of Cromwell's status would have separate, plainer, um, more workmanlike swords for actually fighting with and maybe his Puritan tastes sort of go along with that although there are also some very decorative swords that are quite clearly linked to Cromwell too. Perhaps later someone decided to make the sword look more fancy um, probably after the Act of Union uh, to make it seem more in keeping with what you might expect to see by a sword of Cromwell by adding the Japaning and trophies of arms and, and Union flag so that might have happened. But unless our understanding of the use of Union flags at this period is, is wrong, um, it seems unlikely that the Japaning, or the trophies of arms at least, on there are from the work, uh, sword's working life and are probably applied later. So there you have it, a very controversial sword, possibly owned by one of the most divisive figures in British history and potentially used in one of his most brutal actions in perhaps his most infamous campaign um, but then again may maybe it wasn't um, and unless much more conclusive evidence comes to light like a previously unknown contemporary portrait with him wearing the sword uh, we're unlikely to ever 
really know for sure. So thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw, uh, please do like and follow the channel. If you're willing and able to donate uh, to the museum, that'd be very much appreciated. And there's a link below for that. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next time.